Your eyes and your vision are under attack, damaging blue light from the sun. Your phone, your computer, your tablet, even light bulbs and car headlights is constantly bombarding you. The good news is our eyes actually already have a line of defense to counter the effects of blue light. This defense is made up of three pigments called carotenoids. MacU Health with Micromycel, the only supplement with the exclusive patent on all three macular carotenoids and micromycel technology. Hi everyone, I'm here with Dr. Quadwo Akufo, and I am just excited for you to hear about his research and about his history, what he's doing these days. I got to hear his presentation here at Bonn. It was phenomenal, I know you're gonna enjoy it. But before we get started, doctor, please tell everybody a little bit about yourself, your background, and what you're doing today. Thank you. I'm Dr. Akufu, and I'm currently the a senior lecturer and head of department at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, the Department of Optometry and Vision Science. Uh, prior to this, I did my Doctor of Optometry degree at the same institution, and following this, I did a one-year uh, teaching and research assistantship. Uh, as part of also clinical assistantship in the department, and then won an European Research Council scholarship uh, to travel to Watford Institute of Technology, now Southeast uh, Technological University uh, in Watford, Ireland, to study carotenoids and how they uh, could help patients with early age-related macular degeneration, and also specifically to look at uh, its impact on visual function. During this period, I got to work uh, in different clinical trials, as well as also the Irish Longitudinal Study on Aging, where for the very first time, we looked at the prevalence of age-related macular degeneration in the Republic of Ireland among people um, aged 50 years and over, community-dwelling uh, uh, people in Ireland, and we're able to estimate that uh, in, in Ireland. And for the very first time, uh, getting trained in Morfield's Eye Hospital uh, in retinal grading and also uh, going through all the quality assurance protocols, so moving right. <laughs> back and forth from Watford and, and London. And uh, following this, I got my PhD, which focused on the RET uh, supplement. So we, we use the RET supplement plus mesozeaxanthin and then also compared it with the standard uh, formulation uh, during my study. And, and during my PhD, we found that uh, these supplements do help uh, these patients in terms of their visual function. And then also for majority of uh, patients who passed through our trial, their AMD status were stabilized, but there were also some people who, uh, who also had a little bit of regressions, but overall that was a positive outcome for us. Wow. And now um, following my PhD, decided to go back to Ghana to contribute to training the next generation of vision scientists and optometrists. Wow. Yeah, so, oh, that's uh, that's so good. So that's been my journey yeah, yes. so far. Yeah. Well, what have you been researching most recently that you presented here at Bonn? So I've been uh, trying to uh, take back my expertise in looking at macular carotenoids and yeah. uh, macular pigment and been uh, thinking about how the literature is a little bit uh, uh, limited in yeah. terms of data on macular pigment in the Ghanaian or African uh, populace. So what I did was uh, working alongside and with support from uh, Professor Billy Wharton in Brown University who donated a macular den a densitometer to my lab back in Ghana. We uh, examined uh, 301 healthy participants and to examine for the very first time and also report the uh, levels of macular pigment in our population as well as any determinants uh, that were associated with it. As part of the study, we also did uh, dietary assessments, anthropometry, and other visual measures. Specifically in terms of vision, we, asked, we did visual acuity and then uh, contrast sensitivity. And uh, yeah. due to uh, limitations on uh, equipment, we did some just uh, uh, limited uh, cognitive measures. That's the animal fluency, FAS scores, which are very crude measures, but also, uh, especially for the FAS, uh, tells about executive function and then processing speed in terms of uh, wow. cognitive function. And as, 
Um, after the study, what we found was that uh, the macular pigment levels were comparable in other published data uh, among uh, Caucasians. And, uh, and also, we also found that um, although given that majority of uh, participants who were who were examined as part of the study were healthy, so these were people with standard normal vision, sex sex and better, wow. because we didn't want to include people with any ocular pathologies. Right. So uh, what happened was that we ended up with, we didn't really find associations with visual function, but that's consistent with, with other data that we had. But we found um, um, some association with uh, the FAS score, which tends to, uh, which tells us and contributes to the discussion about how uh, enrichment of, of macular pigment could also yeah. lead to improvements in our brain function or, or cognitive function. So at, at the end of the study, what we find is that, number one, we report uh, reference values for MPOD in our population, but we really also need to look at um, the the serum measurements because yep. as part of our study, we couldn't uh, assess serum uh, due to some limitations. But we we're able to assess the food, and and the food, uh, although we didn't see a correlation with it, but it's quite interesting to really look at the diet, Ghanaian diet, and also the Western diet, and some of yes. the differences and some of the uh, wow. Yeah. I love what you've been doing. That is incredible. Thank you. So clinical significance, what is what have you said to your students yeah. and to other optometrists there that they should take from this and all of us from what the work is that you've done? So from our, our current work, what I would say is that it is important for us to maintain a very healthy diet, yep. a rich in fruits and vegetables. And then also as we maintain that, there are also additional benefits, not only in terms of how best we see or our yeah. ocular integrity in terms of health, yeah. but also there is some benefit in terms of brain function and, and cognitive function. Wow. And this is very important that as optometrists or eye care professionals, we look at these carotenoid formulations as a potential benefit to our patients. I love it. Okay, so here's the final question. What's next for you? So now we're working with other collaborators to try and uh, get some equipment to build up and then also expand our work in cognition. Currently, we got some funding uh, from the Cambridge Cognition, where one of my students won the primary award uh, for the uh, for the uh, Cambridge Cognition Research Grant. Wow. So we we have uh, about 150 cognitive tests, and which are well validated, which we have also the option and also some support on restricted grant to actually look at uh, the cognition in detail. And we want to examine that and also work with other collaborators to now look at the serum measurements and then also see uh, expand that field to see how best we can help people because overall what we see even from this conference is that the benefits of these carotenoids yeah. goes across the lifespan and yeah. where we are heading is also to share with Ghanaians and also the world at large that this is very important message which we all need to to follow I love it that's what I've heard been hearing too and I think everybody has consistently said Early is important in, in your life yeah. to understand it and be a part of uh, healthy eating, exercise, carotenoids. I mean, we've just got to get going and, and omegas. Yeah. So we're hearing the message the whole time we're here. And I love that uh, you've been part of the research and bringing more information to us. I can't thank you enough, Dr. Akufo, for being here with us yeah. and, and sharing what you've learned and continuing to do it because that's what brings us that are seeing patients, it brings all of us more information that we yeah. can then share with our patients. So a big thank you. Thank you too. Hi everyone, we're back here at the Bond Conference and I'm here with Dr. Orozco Hernandez and I'm really excited for him to tell us about his presentation. And But before we start with that, go ahead and tell us about where you practice and what you're doing these days. Okay, yeah, uh, it's really great to be here. I'm glad um, I'm here in the Bonn conference because I uh, sent a paper and it was like uh, accepted. So I'm, I'm really glad. It's the first time I participate in this meeting. But, uh, it's a really important meeting in the area of ocular nutrition. So uh, I'm Axel Orozco Hernandez. I'm an ophthalmologist, a retina specialist. 
uh, based in Guadalajara City. It's in Mexico, it's in the west, north of the country, and it's like a really huge area. We're gonna the visit you sometime, just yeah, so you know. Yeah, <laughs> you should go, actually, you should go. It's, it's really nice. Uh, and I'm uh, primarily in a, in a um, broad and open door clinic, but we, we function as a private uh, foundation. So wow. we, we see a lot of people. And then I have my private office uh, in the afternoon, so, so I'm in both wow. kind of practice. Yeah. That's great. And so you do research? Yeah, uh, actually I'm um, head of uh, the clinical research at, at the hospital and we are doing um, some active uh, research on, on ocular nutrition these days. So to, at this conference, you were one of the first to present. You did a fabulous job. Tell me what your presentation or tell the audience what your presentation was about and then how that relates to practice seeing oh, patients. Okay, yeah, it, it was... Uh, Shocking for me because I kind of opened the, the conference. And we present some uh, clinical cases. We are uh, with patients with um, age-related macular degeneration. So we, we have these uh, patients that do not respond very well to conventional yeah. treatments. And we begin, uh, we begin like an active treatment for them with uh, ocular nutrition and supplementation. And then we, we do a, a long-term follow-up. And we, we see some uh, great results because um, uh, supplementation helped these patients to get stable in their conditions. So wow. I present the, this case of surgery, but I take advantage the, um, that I have a, a lecture so I can give uh, an update on age-related macular degeneration to all the science that attend the, the meeting. Yeah, that was good. That's yeah. good for them to see because they're busy being scientists, helping to develop products and bring products to us, but don't see patients like you do some of them. Yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Uh, I think the, the, the most important uh, uh, of these kind of meetings is that scientists, basic scientists and yeah. clinicians get together. So uh, it, for me, what's really important to give like a, a an update and and highlights the um, the clinical aspects of the attention to the patients. Uh, same as I learn a lot during the conference about like basic uh, science and how they get like the the for example the omega trees right. and get it into a pill uh, and learn all that. I try to to report this to the meeting. So did the vitamins help? You put them on a supplement. Your patients in the in your research and you showed improvement, correct? Yeah, that's that's it. There were patients that were not responding well to conventional treatments and we, of, of course, we do not abandon uh, their standard care of attention, but we do supplement and add this and, and we got the results. What did you supplement with? Uh, it was uh, a formula based in lutein, saxantin and mesosaxantin. Wow. And omegas or just the th the other three? We keep it in macular pigments uh, because for us was important like uh, just to see uh, which um, was like the primary effect on. So when sometimes you do combinations, you don't know. Which made the difference. Yeah. Yes, good point. So then from your study, when now do you start your patients on that supplement? Do you start them when they're early AMD or you? Wh when do you put them on oh, wow. treatment? Yeah, that's, that's also a great question because uh, once we detect a high risk patient, we should begin um, supplementation. I mean, that's a general yeah. knowledge nowadays, but these sp specific patients um, are getting benefit. And f furthermore, um, I thought that um, uh, family members yep. with high risk should begin, like uh, since the child, to, to have the this kind of supplementation. Yes, I heard you say that, and that really struck home to me, that even though a lot of science has shown us to start them later, why would we not start earlier? If I'm at risk, I would want to be protected earlier. Correct, correct, yeah. Uh, I feel the same way because um, it's it's now proven that uh, in between uh, the 20s, 30s, and the 40s, 50s, yeah. how you build your body will be uh, very important like for the yes. late stage in life. That is what we're learning at this conference. It's very interesting. I know I'm having a good time hearing it and learning it because there's nowhere else that I would hear this information. 
Dr. Orozco Hernandez, you are amazing. Thank uh-huh. you for bringing the science and the patient care all to the front line so everybody can see it better. I appreciate what you've done here. Thanks mm. for sharing. No, thank to you. I'm here with Dr. Shelby Temple, and we're continuing our conversation about research that's been presented here at Bonn. So I want to get started by just having you tell everyone a little bit about yourself, Dr. Temple. Sure. Thank you. Um, It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm a visual neuroscientist and visual ecologist, and I've spent the past 25 years studying how eyes work, but mostly in animals, actually. And it's only by serendipity that I happen to be here because my research led to a new way of assessing macular pigments. Um, based on research I was doing on octopus and cuttlefish, of all things. Oh, my goodness. Um, So, yeah, a rather weird way to get here. Um, So my interest now is in uh, how can we use assessing macular pigments to help people improve their behaviors um, and and live better and live better longer, Um, so see better into their future and avoid things like Alzheimer's and dementia things. Thank you so much for being here, and I want to make sure I start by saying thank you for your research. It means a lot to all of us that are out there trying to help our patients to know that someone like you has done the work behind the scenes to help us know what to do. So tell us a little bit more about your presentation and uh, then we'll talk about clinical significance after that. Sure, yeah. So my presentation is on um, how blue light is being misperceived in the, in society, basically. Um, there's a lot of controversy about blue light and some people think, oh, it's really dangerous. Some people think it's not dangerous. And I'm trying to clarify the message so that people understand what does it really mean? Um, and probably the take home message is that blue light is both dangerous and, and beneficial. It does both. Um, but importantly, that it um, is, it's shades of gray or shades of blue in this case. Um, there is too much of a good thing and too much of a bad thing in a sense that you, you can do wrong things. So people are worried about um, phones and, and digital, digital devices, devices yeah. affecting their vision, maybe in the long term and the short term. And the right. reality is that some experts will say, no, there's not enough intensity from these devices that can't possibly hurt you. But what the misunderstanding is that it's not intensity that matters. It's exposure. And exposure is intensity times time. So in other words, if you look at a very dull device through your entire life, you could have the same exposure as 20 minute walks outside every day. Wow. So we need to be conscious that the photons that are being produced by digital devices carry enough energy to cause damage in your eye that accumulates through life. Now to be fair, digital devices are much, much lower than things like going outside, looking at a blue sky. But most of us don't spend a lot of time looking at blue sky and clouds. Yep. So when we compare it to things like just walking down the street, it's about you know, 10, 20% as bright as that. And again, um, if you compare it to, say, reading a paper under tungsten lights like we used to, now looking at a computer screen is sort of 10 times more violet blue light getting into your eye than it used to be. Wow. So there's, you're just trying to put those numbers into context, understand what's the implications. My advice would be the most important thing you could do is don't worry so much about your screens, although, of course, if you dim them down, that's better. Put on a good pair of sunglasses, wear a hat, be conscious of your sunlight exposure, because that's where most of our violet blue light comes from, actually. Wow. Okay. So what about uh, the blue light treatments? Is that part of any of your conversation that you're having? And I don't know if I want to know the answer or not. (laughs) (laughs) So that always comes up. So people want to know, what can I do? How can I avoid this blue light? What what, what lenses should I be wearing? What food should I be eating? Um, And so I've spent a lot of time measuring those things. And that's what I've included in my talk a little bit as well, is kind of where can you get the most benefit? So one of the things you can do to benefit the most is actually have high macular pigments because macular pigments can block up to 90% of that violet blue light wow. and it's put exactly where you need it in your macula um, but if you know if you don't know your macular pigments and you can't assess them with a device like ours then you know you want to take the precautionary approach so put on right. a good pair of sunglasses and those will block sort of between 70 and 95% of the violet blue light um, this is not UV light so the important thing to recognize yes. here is everyone's talked about UV light for ages UV light doesn't get to the retina UV light is blocked by the lens and cornea, as much as 98% of it's blocked. So it's actually the violet blue that we need to be worried about. And this is kind of new information, and people aren't aware of this. Oh, my goodness. All right, so let's back up a little bit. If more macular pigment is protective against damage done by blue light, then uh, at what age should somebody start being concerned about building their macular pigment? Mm, Right away. So that's the interesting thing. So for a long time, people have sort of said, oh, well, macular pigment is something that can affect the last stages of AMD. And we know that they help 
stop progression. But actually, they're also protective. So they're blocking mm. quite a bit of that violet blue light. And in addition to blocking the blue light, they also act as an antioxidant. So they reverse the damage caused wow. by blue light. So we shouldn't be waiting until people are in their 60s, 50s to be doing this. So the device, that, the device that I've invented allows us to assess macular pigments even in children. So we've been using it on four and five year olds, oh, wow. right through to adults. And it's a really simple approach to assessing macular pigments. You can do it in less than a minute. And it allows you just to quickly find out if someone's sort of high, medium or low and whether they should be doing more to protect their eyes. So do you, can we talk about the device? Is sure. it available to people to use in an office? It is, yeah. So we've, uh, I, I invented this device from the work I did on octopus and cuttlefish uh, about seven years ago. And in the last three or four years, we've been commercializing it and selling it worldwide. So it is available now in the US, uh, Canada, Europe. Um, and it's mostly used, it's designed for optometrists. What it gives them is a very simple tool that they can incorporate into a regular eye exam. So it's not something that you need to add on as an extra thing. It takes about a minute to do the test. And the idea is that you can quickly assess someone's macular pigments um, and then give them good advice. And the good advice is around lifestyle. So, you know, avoiding sunlight, eating a good diet, not smoking, staying fit, maintaining a healthy body weight. But in addition, there's quick fixes. So buying a good pair of sunglasses, uh, photochromic lenses, blue light filtering lenses. And what we've shown is that when you use this as part of a regular eye exam, people want to do those things. So they right. optometrists end up selling more of those things. What is so the, everyone wins. What's the name of the device? The device is called the MPI, okay. uh, and it's manufactured by us, Azul Optics, here in the UK, um, but it is available around the world. So Wow. Yeah, look it up. I love this. <laughs> and I love how happy he is. For those of you who are listening and not seeing, uh, it, you don't look like you're at all jet lagged. You look like uh, you, you are just completely, no, totally fine and excited about your research, which is what I love too. I've learned so much, Dr. Temple. Thank you. Thanks for doing this. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you for having me. I want to ask about the octopus though. Can I ask still? Of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tell me, how did, how did that turn into this? It's a crazy story. So um, octopus and cuttlefish don't see color. I don't know if you've ever seen a cuttlefish change colors, but they make um, chameleons look slow. I mean, chameleons wow. gradually change colors. Cuttlefish are doing it on milliseconds, just flashing different colors. It's incredible. An octopus can change really quickly. But wow. they don't see color at all, and they don't need to see color to change colors. Um, but instead of seeing color, which is the wavelength of light, they see the orientation of that wave as it travels through space, which is what we call the polarization of light. So it's the orientation of the light waves. And they do that remarkably well. So they can see differences in the angle of polarization down to less than one degree. And they can keep seeing polarization even when it's only about 2% polarized. So this is remarkable. And my research showed that these were like the most sensitive animals for polarization. But what was exciting for me was that I was doing these experiments and I had to build these special monitors to test these octopus vision. And I would show them like expanding balls and it would make them startle. Oh. Um, but I could see funny patterns as well. And I started digging into it. And the reason I was seeing these patterns was that our macular pigments create a shadow on your retina. And under polarized light, that shadow takes a particular shape called Heidinger's brushes. It looks like a yellow bow tie. And so I had inadvertently, mistakenly, invented a way to assess macular pigments. I had no intentions. I didn't set out to do this. It just happened. Um, so I just thought, well, wait a second, this is worth exploring. So I actually walked away from my academic career to start a company to develop this tool and bring it to eye care professionals. Oh my goodness. That is incredible. <laughs> Hence the smile. It's great to find such wonderful technology and be able to bring it to our practices to make a difference. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Welcome. Temple. Real pleasure. Okay, so my name is Alex Salavilla. I'm from Barcelona. Uh, my whole career uh, has been focusing on omega-3 fatty acids. My PhD was on pediatric nutrition. After finishing that, I went to UK. I changed the subject to cardiovascular disease. And after a long, long time working on omega-3 and cardiovascular disease, I started a line focusing on omega-3 and cognition, brain health, healthy aging, and in particular Alzheimer's disease. Wow. So um, I just presented uh, data on omega-3 biomarkers, which is a good way. I think that it better reflects the dietary intake of the omega-3 fatty acids, which are contained in fatty fish. It's a little bit, little bit better than um, dietary data obtained from, from food frequency questionnaires because it's more objective, it's more reliable. And, well, I presented data on what we did, which was published uh, a few months ago. And it was in the framework of the, of the Framingham offspring cohort. And, uh, it's an American cohort. Yep. And we found that 
going from the top 20 to the bottom 20, your risk of Alzheimer was doubled. In other words, if wow. you increase the amount of omega-3 of DHA in your blood, that relates to a reduction by 50% of wow. the risk. You also can gain some years of extra life in case that you are having Alzheimer's, which is good. Yeah, yeah. It has, well, it, Alzheimer's has a, a, a great socioeconomic burden. Yes. Uh, so in terms of money, is getting some time extra. Right. Uh, it's also important. And also presented what I'm currently doing, which is in collaboration of uh, a very nice center, also located in Barcelona. They have a cohort of cognitively healthy participants, extensively phenotyped for cognition, for neuroimaging, and for wet biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease. So they still do not have Alzheimer's, right. but we know that in brain something happens much before that the clinical onset of the symptomatology. So we are trying to check whether increasing levels of DHA in our blood relates to traits of the brain more resistant to Alzheimer's. Wow. And the clinical implications, okay, this is, these are observational studies. Yeah. We cannot infer any kind of causality, but hopefully this will help to better define future trials, to yeah. better define our population targets, what doses to test, maybe the length, the duration of the of the trial. And I say this, what's next? Yes, so, you kind of told us, but I want to hear. Yeah, well, uh, what's next? So finishing mm -hmm. what we are doing, we also started the collaboration with the UK Biobank. So wow. thousands of participants, we have thousands uh, of omega-3 determinations and just crossing with 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 data on hard endpoints, not only related to Alzheimer's, but also related to ocular, uh, ocular health. Absolutely. So, so I know you said you can't really say as a result of your research that anybody should take a certain dosage of anything at this point. But well, if it were you, yeah. what uh, would you do? Yeah. Actually, I'm eating walnuts three or four times per week. Okay. It's good because it supplies omega-3. That's the vegetable omega-3, it has long been neglected, but I think that this omega-3 also has effects on its own. It's also good sources of other bioactives, other than omega-3. So I eat walnuts two or three, no, three or four times per week. I try to eat fatty fish at least two times per week. I'm from a country where we have plenty of access, plenty of dishes of fatty fish, so I, I do love fatty fish, so it's not a problem for me, but in case I eat I didn't like fatty fish, or maybe if I was a vegetarian or, or right. vegan. So, well, I, I could go for, there are some options as well. So maybe fish oil is not an option if you are a vegetarian, but you can also have access to, to fish, I wouldn't say fish oil, uh, microalgae can also right. synthesize it. So even if you are a vegetarian, you can increase the, the amount of of marine omega-3 fatty acids in your blood. Absolutely. So if you don't want fish, go for fish oil. If you can't or you don't want to consume fish oil, you can also have some, some other choices. I love it. I appreciate your time, no, Dr. Alex Salavia. He <laughs> did a wonderful presentation, and I think that it's just, um, honestly, it's, it's refreshing to know there's folks like you that are doing this research to really have an impact on our patients' lives, our families' lives, and who knows, you know, unfortunately, someone close to us. No, but I think that things you do is it's something really cool because, after all, we are asked not only to publish in top journals, but yes. also try to give something back to the society because most of my career has been paid by, by people paying taxes. So right. I think that it's good to return to the society the effort that they made. So it's good to translate and actually it's something that is really appreciated. And we also are evaluated, not only in terms of the amount of money that we can get or where we publish, but also yeah. how we can reach 
all targets of society. Absolutely. Thank you so much, no, doctor. It was my pleasure. Thanks for your invitation. Before neural lenses, I always had eye strain, eye dryness, eye fatigue, moderate to severe headaches. I had to take prescription medication. It was to the point where I guess they'd want me to sit down and call her or read them books. And I couldn't. I couldn't do nothing. When I got my neural lenses, my headache went away. I wasn't taking Tylenol anymore. Can't explain it, but it worked. I would pay double for my neural lenses because I can't go a day without them. Welcome to Opt In with April Jasper. Dr. Jasper and her guests discuss hot topics, practice management tips, patient care moments, and vendor vignettes in this weekly podcast. Catch it simulcast on YouTube too.